What is grace? Grace is community. Grace is passion. Grace is for everyone. Today we are going to continue our series called All About Love, which comes from a book written by Bell Hooks. We are not doing the usual love everybody song and dance, though. We are diving deep to make it clear what love really means. Last week, we looked at how a clear definition of love can help us choose well with the actions we take. Love is not abuse. Love is not neglect. Love is when we seek the spiritual growth of ourselves and the spiritual growth of others. Uh, when we are focused on whether every action we take will help someone grow spiritually or not, that's when we can love well. I know for myself, this redefinition of love has helped reset my actions toward others. In the last week, I've caught myself so much quicker when I shift into an unhealthy mindset. Having a clear goal to always nurture my spirituality or, or someone else's is literally changing my life. Too often, we've let the world redefine for us so that getting so angry you scream at them seems normal. Hitting people seems sometimes just ordinary. Church, that is not love. And we can do better. We can love people well every day when we commit to helping them grow spiritually with every action we take. So now we look at another aspect of love. This time it's about justice. Love works to bring justice, which means we do what we can to make things right. And we are going to come at this idea from a very unique perspective. We're exploring how justice makes things right, even for children. We just had our vacation Bible school program this past week. We've welcomed 50 plus little ones into the building. So what a great time for us to look at how we do right by them. How can we bring justice for all, including children? We're going to hear our scripture for today from Charlene. Uh, she's new as a member of our church here, so I'm especially grateful for her boldly standing in front of you and sharing God's word with everyone. We're going to hear from the gospel according to Matthew. We don't know who originally wrote this book, but early scholars said they thought it was the disciple of Jesus named Matthew. So we started putting that at the front of the book. Matthew is writing to Christians in conflict with Jewish leadership and wants people to hear Jesus' teachings so they can become followers of Jesus too. This is Jesus teaching his disciples what it means to truly be great. Hear now the word of the Lord. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? He called a child whom he put among them and said, Truly, I tell you, unless you change and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever becomes humble like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. If any of you put a stumbling block before one of these little ones who believe in me, it would be better for you if a great millstone were fastened around your neck and you were drowned in the depths of the sea. Woe to the world because of stumbling blocks. Occasions for stumbling are bound to come, but woe to the one by whom the stumbling block comes. If your hand or your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life maimed or lame than to have two hands or two feet and be thrown into the internal fire. And if your eye causes you to stumble, tear it out and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into the hell of fire. Proverbs 6, 4. And fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. The word of the Lord for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let's join together in prayer. God, may we be an inclusive community passionately following Jesus Christ. As we pursue real justice for all people, let it be an expression of our love for you. Help us to love others well as you love each and every one of us. Open our hearts to your word. In Christ's name we pray.
So I grew up in the 1980s, and the 80s were a very interesting time. That's when we were able to figure out a lot of different things and, and have some real advances in society. The 80s saw the start of Microsoft Windows. Uh, the first cell phones came out then, and Nintendo started. Uh, Michael Jordan started playing in the NBA, and the Berlin Wall was torn down in the 80s. So many things were happening that would move us forward, but there were also a lot of things that we still had to figure out, uh, things like parenting. Uh, I remember when I was little, my parents didn't have to do a lot of discipline of me. I had two loud, older, rowdy brothers that took up most of my parents' attention. Uh, but there were certainly times where all of us children would get smacked on our behinds with a wooden spoon. Uh, worse than the spoon, though, was when my dad would threaten us with the belt. He would do this particular thing. He'd grab both ends of the belt in one hand and sort of hold the other end of it, and he would pull it across. Oh, in the back, I see you do it. You know that motion, and it goes crack, crack, crack. We knew we were in trouble when dad would crack the belt. Uh, now, I don't remember how many times he, he ever hit me, but I do remember one time. Uh, and I just remember that as he hit me with the belt, I was crying. And he would hit me over and over as I cried. But in our family, there was actually one thing that was far worse than either the wooden spoon or the belt. And that was when we would go and visit Grandpa on the farm. Now, Grandpa also had terrible aim. When he would spank... Uh, he would put you over his knees, and he wouldn't hit you on the bottom. He'd either hit you on the thighs or on your lower back. And all it took was one spanking from Grandpa, and you would behave the rest of your time on the farm. Now, many of us, I'm sure, could tell similar stories. You were disciplined with physical pain so that you would learn to behave. This is called corporal punishment, and used to be very common, especially because it got immediate results. If a child was hit for misbehaving, they would almost always change their behavior and do what you told them to do. Not only is this discipline still legal, in about half the country, a public school can use spankings to discipline a student. That may surprise some of you, but perhaps even more bizarre is that we have an amendment to the Constitution of the United States that prevents cruel and unusual punishments. But the Supreme Court ruled that this law of the land does not apply to students in school and that schools can hit children without a parent's permission. I think a lot of us would draw the line right there. If a teacher hit our child, we'd be meeting with the principal and calling for the teacher to be fired. But strangely, we don't apply this same standard in our own homes. There's a story of a woman who met with a, her neighborhood friends. They were all parents of children, and we're talking about this kind of physical punishment of their children. Just about everyone had some kind of experience of being whipped or beaten as children, as many of us do. And all agreed, yes, physical punishment is a must. The men were the most vocal in defending it, but even the women said hitting as a last resort was needed. That's when one woman stood up in defense of these children as one man bragged about the aggressive beatings he had received from his mother and that they had been good for him. She interrupted him and suggested that maybe he might not be such a misogynistic woman hater if he hadn't been beaten by a woman as a child. I'm sure that did not go over well with him. I'm sure most of the people looked at her in stunned silence. But even then, the next person bragged how she never hit her children. Instead, if they misbehaved, she would clamp down on their flesh, pinching them as hard as she could until they got the message. Folks, if I told you that I did that to my wife, you would not tolerate it. Let me be clear, I would never do that. But if a part of a story I told here on a Sunday morning involved me inflicting that kind of pain on Emily, you would be hauling me in to a meeting 
asking if I'm the right person to be the pastor at this church. You'd be calling my boss, telling him, hey, look, this guy hurts his wife. He can't preach here. And if that's the standard for two adults, why is it so different when we are talking about children? I think this is an important point. We seem to be ready to justify violence towards children, but I am convinced that violence breeds violence. There was a man in prison who noticed that all the inmates were covered with scars. He had assumed, like many of us would, that these scars were from their adult lives, from crimes or fights with others. But as he read up on the subject and spoke with the men in prison, he came to realize that the scars were actually from their childhoods. They were given to them by mothers and fathers and other caregivers that would physically beat their children into submission. Violence, I propose, leads to more violence. And I think on some level we know this to be true. My parents would tell me just before spanking me, this is going to hurt me more than it's going to hurt you. They were saying inflicting physical harm on their child does psychological injury to the parents. Nobody wants to hurt their children. Nobody wants to physically punish their children if they don't have to. It's simply what many of us were taught. And we see the immediate behavioral change after physical punishment and we think, oh, maybe this does work. Maybe spanking my kids will lead to hitting them less in the long run. I can certainly appreciate that mindset. Now, I don't want to pretend like I have all this figured out myself. We don't spank or hit our kids, but I have absolutely bear-hugged my child into submission. Was that the right move? Probably not, but it seemed like a good idea at the time. What's most important to me is not telling you how you should parent or how you should raise kids but to be very clear about what the Bible says on the topic. In fact, I'd guess there's more than one person in here who's been thinking in their head about a verse I heard a lot while growing up. My parents quoted it to me time and time again. If you know it, say it with me. Spare the rod, spoil the child. That's right. The idea is if you don't use the rod to hit your child, to discipline them now, then later on they will spoil and be far worse than they are now. But here's the thing. When you look up that quote, you'll find this wisdom from on high isn't even in the Bible. It's actually from the 16th century when someone was trying to summarize their interpretation of other sayings in the Bible. Here are the actual verses. Proverbs 29, 15, the rod and reproof give wisdom, but a mother is disgraced by a neglected child. Proverbs 23, 13, do not withhold discipline from your child. If you beat them with a rod, they will not die. And Proverbs 13, 24, those who spare the rod hate their children, but those who love them are diligent to discipline them. Maybe you would say, spare the rod, spoil the child is a fair summary of those verses. But I know when I was growing up, I heard rod and I thought of, I don't know, a metal bar or a king's scepter or a heavy wooden stick. Uh, but in biblical times, the rod had a very different meaning. The rod was actually the shepherd's staff. It was curved at the end specifically to hook an animal in danger and bring it back to safety. It was also used to separate thick undergrowth to find a lost sheep. You could use it as a weapon, sure, but not to hit the sheep. No shepherd would do that. It was used to hit predators and protect the sheep from death. Go back to those verses with this in mind. Even spare the rod, spoil the child looks totally different now. If you spare the rod, if you do not rescue your child from danger, if you do not search for them when they are lost, if you do not protect them from dangerous predators, the child will be spoiled. They will be destroyed. The scriptures aren't advocating violence toward children. They are advocating nurture and protection like a shepherd to his sheep. Jesus points in the same direction in Matthew 18. 
the disciples are arguing about who is the most important. They want to know how they rank among themselves. And Jesus brings in front of them a child. Children at that time had the lowest rank of any citizen. They were utterly powerless. They had no protection without their parents. Jesus is so protective of these most vulnerable citizens, he says, it would be better if we ended our lives than to cause them to sin, meaning fall away from the faith. Then he goes on to include not just children, but everyone who is weak. If your hand causes you to lead others away from God, cut it off. If it is the eyes, gouge them out. Do these things to protect the weak. You must shield them from the enemy. Now let me be clear, Jesus is not saying we should kill ourselves or cut off our hands. This is hyperbole. This is a dramatic statement meant to help us take it seriously. Children and the weak among us need our help. They need us so desperately that we must act urgently on their behalf. Stop worrying about who's the best or the brightest. Stop bickering about the little details of life. Let's get to work on helping these kids now know Jesus and make, making this world a better place. So I mentioned earlier in the service that we just had our vacation Bible school program this week. I have to say I am very impressed with the volunteers in our program. I hate to say it out loud because I don't want to jinx it, but when Chris, our VBS coordinator, called staff meetings at 8.30 in the morning, everybody showed up. I have never seen that before in a VBS program. When we sang and danced, all the crew leaders and adults were singing and dancing too. They were an incredible example for the children. This has been an awesome week of connecting with the children in this community and sharing with them God's incredible love for them. We had a, a moment, though, in one of our volunteer meetings where someone said, I had a student say, I don't believe in any of this stuff. None of this matters. When she first heard it, she was stunned, so she wanted to know from the group what she should say. How do you respond to a child who says, I don't care about God? And I shared, look, we want that child here. We love them and care for them and want them to know God's love uh, and that God loves and cares for them too. If they don't believe today, does that mean we somehow love them less? No, of course not. We might pursue them even more because we are going to go after the lost sheep. We are going to work even harder to protect them from the enemy and the ills in this world that they don't even yet understand. I've seen a fifth and sixth grader who hated God go through confirmation classes and become a, a ninth and tenth grader who is deeply religious, pursuing God's love for everyone. That's what can happen when we take our job seriously. That's what happens when we protect and rescue and search for the lost. When I stopped talking in the meeting, I could see people nodding their heads. Yeah, that's right. We do keep loving them. Their doubt doesn't make us shy away one bit. And that's been our approach all week long. Love these little ones with the love of God, no matter how tired we might be, no matter how challenging the responses are. Keep searching, keep rescuing, keep loving them. Let's end with this. Uh, there was a, a young boy who was in middle school. His name was Anthony. And Anthony was told in the classroom that he needed to remove his hat. And he outright refused. And because of his refusal over and over, he was sent down to the principal's office. And the principal met with Anthony. And he asked him to remove his hat. And again, Anthony refused to do it. And so in this moment, he could have asserted his authority and demanded that the boy remove his hat from his head. But instead, the principal did this. He asked a question. He said, this is a simple enough request. Why aren't you removing your hat? And the boy told him, he said, I went with my parents to the barber this past week, and when they cut my hair, I didn't like the results. 
he was too embarrassed to remove his hat. So the principal, he actually had some skill in this area. He said, hold on a, a moment. He went and he got some pictures and he showed this child how he had been cutting hair since he was a teenager and that he cut his own boy's hair and showed him the results of the haircuts he had given to his own children. And he said, if I run home and I grab my clippers and I come back and fix your hair, will you take your hat off? And the boy hesitated for a moment, but he agreed to it. Yes, I'll, I'll take my hat off. And so he ran home, got, got the clippers, came back, cut the boy's hair, and he w sent him back to the classroom, and he, they had no problems. The hat was removed, and the boy behaved perfectly well in the classroom. And that, I think, is a lesson for each and every one of us. Can we help children in a way that avoids violence? Can we trust that God is at work even when they might disagree with us? That's what love for the weak among us looks like. We keep working for answers, knowing that violence isn't going to solve anything. Jesus invites us to seek and rescue those who can't do it for themselves. And you're hearing some squeaking back there. That's a bird that was gently caught, but is excited to be free outside of the sanctuary here this morning. <laughs> Praise God. Well done, Eric. Well done. <laughs> May we be a place that nurtures all those who are vulnerable, even little birds. May we always offer God's love with justice, no matter the circumstances. Amen. Amen. For everything happening at Grace, check out our website at gumc.org.